Good morning, everyone. So thanks all for coming. Thanks for folks uh, that we cannot see, but they can see us in uh, New York and Kirkland who are also interested in watching this talk. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce Professor Len Waverman. He's the chair of economics at the London Business School. Uh, he's uh, you know, a colleague of Hal Varian, who many of us know. Uh, he's been doing a lot of work with us uh, for many, many years. And several of us have been to his seminars where he talks to us about uh, you know, his work on real estate bubbles and uh, how they would impact us and so on. And Professor Waverman has been spending several years doing research on uh, using economic theory to see how telecommunications affect GDP and national growth, especially in emerging markets like Africa. And uh, you know, one of the things that has always struck me when you look at the globe downstairs in Building 43 that shows how the Google queries are emanating uh, from different parts of the world, there's one part of the world which is very dark, right? and that's the continent of Africa. And uh, frankly, as a company that's out there to make a global impact, that's an area of concern for us. And how can we enable uh, the closure of this digital divide, but you know, not doing it just because we need to close the digital divide, but it has a real impact on the economics of the region. And what uh, you know, Len's going to talk to us about is how that happens and share with us some of his research. Uh, this talk is most likely going to be uh, published also externally. So if you have any confidential questions, uh, I request you not to ask them, Google confidential questions, not to ask them during the talk, but maybe right after. Uh, but feel free to ask questions either during or after, depending on uh, how Len prefers it. Thank you very much, and I give you Professor Waverman. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Deep. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today uh, in lovely, warm uh, Northern California. Reminds me why I live in London. Uh, when I moved there from the University of Toronto, people said, why would you leave Toronto for London? I said it was for the weather. So, uh, so uh, yeah, my research has been on the impact of communication systems on economic growth. I have a book coming out called uh, Network Computer, uh, Cambridge University Press, uh, late in this year with my colleague Mel Fuss. Uh, and it, what, it, what it tries to do is give uh, the, the rights, the, the communications part of the new economy. Uh, Google is an amazing firm, and it's just delightful for me to be here and to, to talk to you. And, and a two-way talk, anytime you have a question, please, please ask it. But uh, one has to remember that uh, communications is really the backbone for computing. The, the new economy, the so-called impact of computers on economic growth and productivity really relies on big telecom networks allowing computers to interact, ship data, and so that's why it's the network computer. I'm on an advisory board at Vodafone on a project called The Social Importance of Mobile. And there are a lot of anecdotes about how mobiles are transforming the developing world, especially parts of Africa and Indonesia. Uh, and uh, when I said, you know, anecdotes are nice, but you know, I'm an economist. Uh, can we get some, uh, something more scientific than anecdotes? They said, well, OK, why don't you do it? And so I, I started looking at how to estimate how to measure this. And I'll talk about how we do that. Uh, it's a difficult problem, uh, but we, we, I think we have some evidence which I'll show, show you and share with you some very recent research which backs that up. So let's begin uh, in uh, the year uh, zero, the year, uh, if we look back at history, uh, and this is the shares of world GDP from zero to 2000, and you can see the world began in India. Uh, early on, India was by far the richest country on Earth, uh, share 32% of GDP. I don't know how people measure these things, but, <laughs> but don't ask me. <laughs> okay. These are guesstimates. Uh, and you can see you're just behind India's China. So China and India were half of the world GDP f uh, up until around 1400. Okay? So for mo most of the world's history, China and India led the world. Uh, then they, uh, you can see the, the kind of collapse in both China and India. 
The collapse as share of GDP is also because of the huge growth in, in Western Europe and the United States. So you can see that by, uh, you know, in, in 1950, the U.S. and Europe are half of the world's GDP. Uh, India and China are pretty small at that point. Uh, at the bottom is Africa, which has never amounted to very much. Uh, diamonds, if you've seen blood diamonds. Uh, yeah. But the developing world is coming back. Uh, we talk about the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, where the growth is today, uh, where the opportunities are uh, for both uh, any kind of business uh, and where democracy and real opportunities for entrepreneurship are occurring. On this chart, what we have uh, is something you don't have to, I don't have to talk to you about much, is just uh, the digital divide. What do we have here, which you can't see because of the black lettering, uh, uh, so the countries from left to right are Sweden, uh, the United States, France, Malaysia, Senegal, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Ghana. Uh, so you can see, uh, and there are three, thing, three columns. The first column is personal computers per 1,000 people in 2003, so com computer density. The second one is internet density, internet users per 1,000 people in 2003. And the, the white column is mobile phones per 1,000 people. So uh, if we compare Sweden and Senegal, uh, that is the first uh, columns, and the uh, fifth, you'll see that PC, the ratio of PCs in Sweden to those in Senegal per 1,000 people is 30 to 1. Yeah. And the ratio of internet users in those two countries is 30 to 1. And the, but the ratio of mobile phones is still very much in Sweden's favor, 17 to 1. If we compare the, US, the U.S. and Malaysia, U.S. is the second set of uh, columns, Malaysia the fourth, PCs in the U.S. to Malaysia is only four to one. Now you think of the huge gap in GDP per capita between those two countries. Internet use, the uh, U.S. is only 50% more per capita internet use. Uh, and in mobiles, it's about the same. Now, uh, on this next chart, all I've done is add mobiles in 2005 as the fourth column. And so you can see, if you're looking at the developing world, which is everything from the fourth uh, set of columns on, Malaysia, Senegal, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Ghana, the huge increase in mobiles over a couple of years. So the, the growth... Uh, in Malaysia, went for 442 or 44 mobile phones per 100 people in 2003 to 75 per 100 in the, two years later in 2005. Okay. So the density, that the penetration of mobiles in Ghana, it went from 39 in 2003, uh, uh, from 3.9 in 2003 per 100 people to 13 three years later. So huge boom in mobile phones. Uh, and on this chart, you can see a quote from the World Bank, which is that the people in the developing world are getting more access at an incredible rate, far faster than they got access to new technologies in the past. The digital divide is rapidly closing, and that's the mobile phone. The mobile phone is closing the digital divide because it's a much lower cost technology. It's, it's much more scalable. You can bring it out, uh, at, at roll it out at, at a much different rate than landlines. Landlines require cables in the ground. Uh, that's very costly, and it's certainly open to theft. Copper uh, in the jungle can be ripped out very quickly. A cell phone site actually doesn't have that much that's stealable because it doesn't have much secondhand value. What's multiplex equipment worth, right? Plus, you can put a guard in there. Uh, and and uh, the car, the car, these photographs from a colleague of mine show you something odd. This is a company, if you know yellow in Africa, this is in Kinshala. The yellow is what company? MTN. 
MTN is one of the great mobile companies in the world. In fact, if you're looking for what innovation in mobile, don't look at singular. <laughs> don't look uh, at the West. Look at Africa. Look at the Philippines. Look at China. That's where the innovations are occurring in the use of mobile phones. And the companies in Africa like MTN, Celtel, which is now owned by MTC Kuwait, or Ascom, these are the firms we should be fearing in the West because their business models and what they're doing with mobile phones are something that in Europe and in, in North America, uh, we really haven't scratched that surface. We really haven't thought of mobile phones as the major screen, the major instrument. And here what you see odd is you see that it looks like a payphone. It's designed to look like a payphone because people are used to what a payphone is. There's, what's odd about this payphone? It's a, yeah, it's on a, it's on a bicycle. Right? And, and there's no wire there, folks. You know? There is no wire. That is a mobile phone disguised as a normal payphone on a bicycle. Okay. Now, Mo Ibrahim, the founder and, and uh, executive chairman of Celtel, sub-Saharan Africa, in 2005, mobile phones grew at 67% compound rate of growth compared with 10% in Western Europe. Last year, there were more new mobile phone customers in Africa than in North America. If you talk to Vodacom in South Africa, which is a Vodafone subsidiary, they had more net ads last year at income levels they thought they would never reach. The greatest road of growth they ever had was last year. Okay. Why is this occurring? Uh, in fact, and when we look at the data, we see that people in developing countries can be spending upwards of 15% of their annual income on a mobile phone. And there, and there's some, there's some who look at that and say, what a waste. You know, they're getting these gadgets, these fashion items from the West, and they're wasting their income on mobile phones. And that's what, because I think those critics don't understand the crucial role of communications in economic development. That for economic development to occur, and we, and we all want uh, to help, to want to understand more deeply why uh, Africa has not developed? What are the circumstances which are holding it back beside bad governance? One needs social overhead capital. One needs roads. One needs electricity grids. One certainly needs telecom systems. I think there's an underestimate out there about the role of communications, the role of search, the role of information in economic development. Yeah. If you read uh, the uh, the uh, like the uh, Millennium Development Report, uh, Jeff Sachs uh, and others uh, talking about what has to be done, and they're absolutely right about what has to be done. But when you read those kind of, that report, the role it's two hundred but two two hundred and seventy pages long, and the role of the private sector is how many pages out of two hundred and seventy pages? Nine. The role of the private sector is nine pages, and the role of communications is kind of throwaway line. Because I think there is not an understanding about the necessity of communication systems to provide, to provide markets. People don't want to be subsistence farmers. But if you're in a rural village in Africa or in India, and there's no communications, the trader comes to town, provides you with the fertilizer, provides you with the seeds. There is no option. He tells you the prices. Then he comes and buys any excess grain that you may have. There's no market. You're completely at the mercy of the trader. Okay. And we'll be looking at data shortly. We'll just show uh, in Indonesia for fishermen what the differences are when there are mobile phones. Okay. So the new economy is about commuter, computers communicating on modern telecom networks. The, the version of the new economy in the developing world uh, is really about 
the pro uh, provision of communications for enabling information flows. And information flows are going to come in a variety of ways, both over landline and mobile, uh, and are going to be powered by the need for people to be in market economies. So communication networks widen markets. You can't have markets if you can't communicate. You need the information to provide you with the alternatives to get the best price, to understand what you can sell and what you can buy. We in the West forget that. We assume uh, that their information is readily available. It wasn't so long ago that that didn't occur. I mean, the, the original robber barons, you know, the melons of the world, they made their money uh, from the, from, by having either the fastest train or the fastest steamship. Because we had to physically transport information. And uh, modern communication is extraordinarily recent. When was the first transatlantic telephone cable? What year? was the first transatlantic telephone cable which occurred be was built between the UK and the US. Who wants to give me an answer? 1920s? 1935? 1951, much closer, it was 1956. This is the 50th, uh, we just passed the 50th anniversary of TAT-1, Transatlantic Telephone 1, a joint venture of AT&T and the British government, which besides Sputnik was the engineering marvel of the 1950s. And that TAT-1, before that, if you want to make a call there's nobody in this room who can remember making a call before 1956 but me. <laughs> if you want to make a call between uh, uh, North America and Europe before 1956, how would you do it? Radio, bounce it off the stratosphere. You'd book a call three weeks in advance and sit by the phone for hours for the operator to connect you and say there are sunspots today. And it was, and it was $30 a minute. Now, TAT-1 in 1956 had the capacity of how many simultaneous voice calls? 83. <laughs> 83. So when we think about the vast fiber underneath oceans, yeah. that's 10 years old. We're, you know, the communications, even in the West, is extraordinarily recent. That's why the information age is just beginning. And we're just scratching the surface. Because, you know, bandwidth, uh, you know, remember when bandwidth was a 56K modem? Right? Bandwidth on a mobile phone is still very limited. Broadband everywhere is going to lead to the next information age, right? So it's going to so modern communications lower widens markets, lowers transactions costs, provides the necessities of being an entrepreneur, of being in markets. Sir. So I completely buy into the importance of communication for economic development. But what about transportation? I mean, the Western world has had roads since the time of Rome and did pretty well by them. But that's ahead of Africa, a lot of parts of Africa. So the question is, what about also the role, uh, the role of uh, physical transportation besides communications transportation? It, uh, with Vodafone, we've been studying uh, what does it cost to the annual cost of having a bicycle in rural India? Buying a bicycle and the annualized cost of that are about 15% of income. But then when you have the bicycle to get information, you have to actually physical travel to town. So roads are essential, absolutely. You can't move the goods. But you can't be part of the market economy without communications. And communication networks are a better medium than roads for communications, which I think comes before you can move the goods. But I agree, social overhead capital is not just about mobile phones. And when I talk about the importance of mobile phones in Africa and India, it doesn't mean that it's better than having health or education. I'll show you at the end that that's not true. It's one of the things we need, but it's not everything. What's 
status of roads, is there enough transportation for people to be able to, in general, take advantage of, of uh, leveling of markets? Uh, no. I was just uh, in Beijing. I take the executive MBA students to Beijing uh, every year for the study trip to China. And on the trip, I had four uh, executive students uh, from India. Uh, and they, when they, we got to, after a day in Beijing, they said, oh my god, India's in trouble. They actually have roads here. <laughs> so so uh, the problem, you know, the, we're, at, we're all academics here, right? So the, the problem as an academic is uh, how do you demonstrate the importance? Uh, here is a chart which shows on the, on the uh, horizontal axis I have GDP in 1980. And on the vertical axis I have uh, average telecom penetration, teledensity. And you can see the, that orange line is the correlation. And you can see the correlation is about 0.9 between GDP and telecom penetration. Yeah. The problem with correlation is just correlation. It doesn't tell you cause and effect. It doesn't tell you what causes what. Because we know as, as, as uh, people and as economies get richer that telecoms is also luxury goods, so they demand more of it. So the causation could be from economic growth or income to teledensity not from teledensity to economic growth. So we can't say from this simple correlation, look, uh, what you need to grow is get more phones. I could show you the same chart, and I think next time I give a talk I will, which would have on a, a GDP on, on the horizontal axis and the vertical axis have white wine consumption per capita. <laughs> Has a very high correlation of about 0.6. Because uh, you know, with the trends are as you grow, as you get richer, you drink more white wine. You substitute that for beer. Right? But it's obvious that you're not going to have that kind of correlation and say, okay, Africa, drink more white wine. Right? <laughs> you know, that's not going to, you know. So we really want to know causality. You can't build public policy or advice based on correlation. So as an academic, the problem is one of building models which do causation and not correlations. I published a paper in 2001 with Hanrik Roller where we did this for the OECD and for landlines in the 1970s and 1980s. Okay? And it was a, a multi-equation model that basically controlled for, for spurious correlation and controlled for endogeneity between income causing demand for telephones and demand for telephones, the growth of telephone phones causing growth. Because it's just the latter we want to know. We want to know, do telecoms, are they good for social health? Are they good for society? Should there be policies to really promote communications? So we built this model called the production function, four equations with endogenous demand and supply of telephones in it. And we got a very, very, interesting results. Uh, substantial growth dividend from telecoms and the OECD in the 70s and 80s. In the United States, we found about 10% of all the economic growth that occurred in the US in the 70s and 80s was due to telecom development. Okay? Now, if you, want, want, you may wonder, uh, is, does that sound reasonable? I have another one of these kind of uh, odd questions for you. How many phones were there per 100 people in France in 1970? Now I can pick on France because I'm a French citizen. You know, French are paranoid. But I can do this being French, uh, and French and I'm Canadian. So how many phones were there per 100 people in France in 1970? 1970 wasn't as long ago. 50 per 100? 10. 10. 10. 15 or 15. Actually, the answer is eight. <laughs> <laughs> but that beat Greece with five and Portugal with six. As I said with, uh, with my story about uh, the first transatlantic cable, uh, modern telecoms is very recent. Remember, Europe had emerged from the Second World War. 
and really hadn't thought of telecommunications as being really essential to economic growth. And so here is a chart which shows you the teledensity, that is the number of phones per 100 people. Uh, Austria, Canada, France, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, United States, in uh, 1970, which is in blue, and 1980, which is in orange. And you can see the enormous growth in mainline phones. That is the, you know, the thing that's still connected to a line that sits on a wall somewhere. I don't see many here. You know, you know the mainline phone, it's usually black. You can get a fashion item now. It can be white. And, and they're really remarkable now. You know, they will redial the last number. And it will, could have, uh, could remember up to 200 numbers. You know, it has uh, maybe 8K of memory. And these are really, when you think about what has happened to the instrument for mainline phones, it's really surprising how little it answers. You know, computing occurred, and the telephone companies ignored it. But that's a different story. I don't want to pick on telephone companies. So you can see the, 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 the uh, big change in telecom penetration main lines between 1970 and 1980. Huge investment went on in the West uh, in, in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, the number I said, how many main lines per 100 people, is a little odd because universal service is one phone per home. So you've got to think about how many phones per 100 is universal service. So what's the average household size? Around two and a half. So 40 phones per 100, 40 main lines per 100, is basically universal service. So you can see universal service existed in Canada in 1980, uh, the US, uh, Sweden in the 1970s, but nowhere other in Sweden or Finland in the 1970s. So this is the fixed lines. The blue now is 1995. I showed you fixed lines in the developing world in 1970, 1980. It would be down at the bottom because there was none. So the blue is 1995. The orange is 2003. And you can see here for these countries, Bolivia, China, uh, the first two, Tunisia at the end, the increase in main lines uh, over that very short time frame and the outstanding example is China. If you think of the population China, size of China and the physical geographic size, to go from three phones per 100 people in 1995 to 20 in mainline phones, that is the stuff that's wired in the ground, is astonishing. It's astonishing what happened. But if you look at countries like Morocco, you can see main lines went the wrong direction. There were no net additions. And even at the, if, we, you know, if you look at that chart, you can see that uh, you know, 15 main lines per 100, we haven't reached that anywhere but in China and those countries. So nowhere near universal service. This is mobile phones per 100 people in the same year as uh, the blue is 1995. You can see blue doesn't peak much above zero. And the orange is only eight years later. Again, China, look, going from zero to 22 mobile phones per 100 in eight years. And look at Morocco. Remember, main lines, no net additions, but they've gone from basically zero to 23 main, uh, mobile phones per 100. So mobile phones is the growth in communications in the developing world. Yeah. And then the question is, well, do mobiles in the developing world provide the same kind of impact on economic growth that main, main lines did in the OECD in the 1970s and 1980s? Are they being used in the same way? Again, okay. so we get back to a model and econometrics to try to figure out causation. Because the correlation is not going to be of much use. Plus, when we start looking at the developing world, we have bad data. And we have uh, countries which have wars. We have poor economic results. And we have a lot of investment in mobile phones. So one has to be very careful in these kinds of models how we, as scientists, come up with 
evidence from which we can base policy on. Because we want to be, if we're going to tell, say that mobile phones are good for your health, then we want to be very careful that we have evidence for that. And so we, uh, here we built an, what's called an endogenous growth model. If Hal Varian was here, he could talk about this as well. Where we're looking at broad, decades long averages of economic growth and what are the, some of the main causes of growth. We have in here telecom penetration, thick, mobile and fixed, and we have uh, investment, and we have primary school completion. We're looking at skills, we're looking at human capital that's being added over these years. I won't go through the, uh, the results or the econometrics, we had a 92 country sample from 1980 to 2003, both developed and developing. And the results from the model were, and this was reported in The Economist magazine, March the 12th of 2005, actually had a, the front cover was a, an African child holding a mobile phone made of sand. That 10% difference in, in mobile penetration levels leads to a 0.6 percent difference in growth rates. I'll explain what that means in a moment. But it's a very robust result. And uh, it also, the econometrics show that mobiles add a little to growth in the developed world. Right? The people already have main lines. But it adds a lot in the developing world. And that kind of, you know, we have very scientific tests in economics. It's called the smell test. Right? Does it smell right? Should mobiles be more important in the developing world than in the developed? Yeah, smells right. Yeah. So, the, uh, so this was what the model showed. Uh, and let me explain what it means. So here I have two countries, uh, Indonesia and the Philippines. The Indonesia is in blue and the Philippines is in orange. And the first uh, two columns, right here, we have the current levels of GDP growth per capita. You can see that uh, Philippines is growing around 2.5% a year, 2.6% a year, and Indonesia is growing 1.6% a year. So Indonesia is growing slower by 1% a year than is uh, the Philippines. Now, it, in, in, the, in the model we've developed, it's over decades-long averages. You can't expect to put mobile phones in tomorrow and get economic growth the next day. It really requires a lot of changes to occur in society and in the use and markets to start functioning. So this is not like an instantaneous prescription for growth. Okay. But here, in, this, in what's labeled two, what we do is we, over 20 years, equalize the mobile phone penetration rate between Indonesia and the Philippines. And you can see that doing that increases the growth in, rate in Indonesia by about 1% a year. So the gap in mobile phone penetration, which was uh, in this year, in 2003, there were nine mobile phones per 100 people in, in Indonesia and about 21 in the Philippines. So we equalized that gap over a long period of time. We increased growth in Indonesia to about the same as the Philippines. So that shows you the importance of mobiles. But as I said earlier, yeah, uh, and, and was asked, what about roads? What about education? What about public health? What about hospitals? I mean, there are a lot of things that are uh, absent in the developing world. And so here on, on the last, what's labeled number three, those columns there, keep mobile phones way below the Philippines and Indonesia, keep it at the level of 2003. But what we do is increase the primary school completion rate slowly in Indonesia to match the Philippines. Philippines has a much higher rate of people with primary school education levels. So we increase that in Indonesia. And you can see then Indonesia grows faster than the Philippines. So the, re you know, the real question for public policy would be, 
if I have an extra dollar to spend, would I want to spend it on mobile phones or on education or on health? I can't answer that. Not from our work. You can see that a lot of things are important to growth. So it's not the, I don't want to leave you with the feeling that all we have to do in Africa is provide mobile phones. That's wrong. Mobile phones are one of the avenues of growth. May not, maybe even not the most important one. But it is an important way of people to be, get into markets to increase incomes. Okay. Uh, in the present research we're doing, we're looking at what we call the consumer surplus. What are the benefits uh, to uh, consumers from the spread of mobiles? This is for those of you who are any, any economists out there? So, so thanks for having a few here. I appreciate that, Google. So uh, what we're doing here is what uh, we're sh looking at the benefits to consumers over and above the price. And you can see that the spread of mobiles in China is worth something like 2% of GDP. In Ecuador, 4%. We've done this for a whole set of developing countries. It's another measure of the value of mobiles in development. Now, let me give you some other evidence. Because you can say, well, economy-wide production functions or endogenous growth models. I'm looking all of Indonesia, and uh, you know, maybe that's a little too grandiose. So here's a recent paper that's coming out in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, Robert Jensen at the Kennedy School. What he did is he got data from, uh, let me get exact years here, from September 3rd, 1996 to May 21st of 2001, weekly data from 15 fishing villages in, Indonesia, in India in the state of Kerala. So what he did is he actually gathered for 20, firm, for 20 fishermen, 10 large and 10 small, weekly for that entire time period, how much did they receive for their fish? and where did they land it. Because what he knew was, uh, is in this chart here is what this chart shows is in these three regions, when were mobile phones introduced? So uh, in the region one, it was introduced on January 31st of 1997. On a second region, July 6th of 19, in 1998. And in the last region, only in 2000. So this was a great way of doing a natural experiment to see how did fishermen do? Did they make more money? And do consumers benefit with the spread of mobiles? Because the anecdote is this. If you're a fisherman off the coast of Kerala and you have your, your catch of fish, you then go to port, and the port then tells you what your catch is worth. You may not like that price, but what are you going to do? These fishing villages are 15 kilometers apart. Going to get back in your boat and try the next village? Maybe there's nobody left there trying to buy fish. Okay. So there's no information about what the market opportunities are. So the people, the fishermen, then are really at the mercy of the people buying. And the evidence uh, was that. Uh, and these three regions are three different catchment zones for fish. And all the fishermen in those catchment zo zones in region one would always sell in region one. They'd never cross the boundary to region two or region three, even though uh, a 15 kilometer trip uh, would only cost something like 5%. The fuel of that would only cost like 5% of the value of the catch. But they never did it. They had no idea what those other markets would be. So now come mobile phones. So the, you know, the, the story is you now you're on your boat, so you got the mobile phone, you phone in, and you say, OK, what are you paying? Here's what I got today. What are you paying? I don't like that. Or you phone 10 different people, four, three different ports, 100 different people. You do SMS, right? Because an SMS is like a contract. It's not, you know, 
SMS is nice because it's physically, you know, you can go back and say, hey, here's what you promised to pay. So does that really matter? Well, here is the mobile phone adoption by fishermen. Uh, this shows you uh, when it becomes available. You can see mobile phone adoption is basically zero until a, you can see the, the, uh, the phones added, the black, sharp black line going up sh shows when there are phones in that district. So district one, they came in very soon. And mobile phone adoption in 20 weeks went to 85%. 85% of fishermen had mobile phones within 20 weeks of them being available. <coughs> look at region two, look at region three. When these devices were available, they were used. Now, it wasn't that anybody actually decided to have mobile phones for fishermen. It's just when they put in the base stations, there was of sufficiently close to the coast that they covered an area 30 kilometers outside the coast. You know, not that they ever thought the fish would want mobile phones, right? But fishermen quickly adapted the technology amazingly fast. And you can see it's unanimous, right? This is not a slow adaption rate. This is phones are there. First, the big boats get them. Then everybody gets them. This is an adaption curve, which is amazing. And here's what happens to prices. So again, the price dispersion you see before my mobile phones, remember he was, what Jensen was getting was all the weekly prices from 20 fishing boats. And you can see the huge variance in prices before the adoption of mobile phones. In fact, 8% of the catches were wasted because when they came to port, the price was zero. Nobody wanted fish. Although 15 kilometers away, there were buyers who had no fish to buy because there's nobody in that port with fish. So the huge, there was a huge social waste. So the price dispersions are enormous. You can see what happens as soon as you get mobile phones. The dispersion goes down remarkably from a 60% significant dispersion to 6% and lower. Uh, and then what he does is test for the law of one price. Is there a single price for fish across these three regions? Before, there, before mobile phones, there isn't, because the fishermen in that catchment zone always went to those ports. Afterwards, 30 to 40% of the fishermen go to another region. Right? And that's this arbitrage means that after the uh, mobile phones, there is a single uniform price for any kind of fish across the entire area. The average revenue of fishermen went up by 8%. The average price of fish to consumers fell 6%. And there was no waste. So very large social benefits. Oh. So why are people spending 15% of their income on phones? Is it a fashion device? For some of them, yeah. But it really is an information gathering tool. Mobile phones are providing a very vital communications, absolute need. Now we forget, we know what markets are here. But in the developing world, markets don't function. They don't function properly because there's very little information. Remember, information is power. And there's no power to providers like single fishermen before mobile phones. I see some questions. Is that increase in their revenue net of the cost of mobile phones? Uh, yeah, uh, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, in Jensen's thing, it is not. But uh, it's the uh, increase in the revenue is of sufficient magnitude that even when the first mobile phones cost $100. So uh, if you, you could amortize them over, over about four months uh, for these kinds of benefits. See, another question. You know, uh, most of this study is when the transactions that happen with a voice based or a database or SMS or more people Yeah, I'll be turning to, to that. Was it voice or SMS? We see a, there's a lot more research can be done 
as to the differences in the uses of mobile phones in the developing world. The data I've seen, for example, from South Africa show that in the rural areas, the amount of incoming SMS relative to the outgoing SMS is 13 to 1. Much different ratio from what we see in the West. And that's because the richer people in urban towns are, call, are SMSing them. So we're seeing very different patterns. Uh, and I'll come to at the end whether I think it's voice or data. I think that's a very important point. How much of this are data services? And, and also, couldn't we be using voice for data services as well? Because search can be voice uh, as opposed to SMS. Now, the, the founder of Reliance, uh, Ambani in, in India, said if a telephone, he said this a few years ago, if a telephone call could be made cheaper than the postcard in India, it will transform every home, empower every Indian, remove every roadblock to opportunity and growth, and demolish every barrier that divides society. So what about Google? What about the digital divide? What can you do? Well, at the moment today, actually this is about a, a, data, about a month old, there are 2.2 million mobile phone users in the world. One, uh, 2.2 billion mobile phone users in the world. 1.4 billion of those are in the developing world. There are many more mobile phone users in the developing world than in the developed world. That's not true for PCs. In the developing world, mobiles are used to access information, as we just showed. So what can Google do about that? How can you help? I know uh, you have a big group looking at this. So uh, you know, I may be adding very little to your innermost thoughts, which I don't know. But, um, Clearly, we need better search tools for mobile phones in the developing world. <clears throat> uh, what's the main impediment to the use of SMS? Illiteracy. Illiteracy. The literacy rate in a number of these countries is extremely low. So it's very difficult to use a mobile phone for search, either SMS search or a Google search when you can't read. And so therefore, I, you know, we need some kind of other ways of acquiring information. Now, when I said that uh, these firms in the developing world are really innovative, they're, they're innovative because they're developing banking tools. Because in a number of, uh, of these countries, Banking is something that doesn't exist in rural areas. And there's no access to banking uh, from uh, the poor. If you drive in from Johannesburg, from the airport, the highway is just littered with signs. And what it says is carpenter and gives a phone number. Because remember, a mobile phone is a very different tool than a landline phone. I talked about universal service for landlines being a phone for every home. But mobile phones are extremely, are personal devices, you know, one for every person. Because what they are in the developing world is their identity. Because if, if you live in a shanty town, nobody's going to come and knock on your door and offer you a job. Nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows where you are. But a cell phone number is identity, public key encrypted, unique number. It's an identity. And we're seeing in the developing world, people are now, even if mobile phones are mainly prepay, 95% prepay, so you top up your phone. They're going to their mobile phone provider, and they're asking for the records of how much they've used their phone and how much they've used it in prepay, how much money they've put it into it, as a very simple credit check. It shows, look, here's, I've had this phone for two years or a year. Here's the money I've used on it. Here's all my calling. I'm a responsible person. 
They have nothing else. So the mobile phone uh, and its records is something much more than a simple communications tool. And a number of these cell phone operators, Celtel uh, and others, are <clears throat> understanding this and using these for very kinds of new services. Banking, one of them. And so what we find is that in the developing world, how do you do banking if you're illiterate? Somebody shows you the keystrokes. You don't know the numbers. You don't do, know the letters. But somebody shows you if you do these seven keystrokes, here's what you can do. And people have learned those. So this keystroke wrote root is some way of doing search. Or icons. Or pictograms. Something where the people who are illiterate, they don't want to be illiterate. I mean, they want to function. We've seen enormous entrepreneurship. Look, I mean, you know, Grameen Phone, the, the Nobel Peace Prize, partly because of mobile phone provision in Bangladesh, you know, where in each village you have uh, usually a woman who becomes the entrepreneur, you know, borrowing the few dollars to invest in the mobile phone and reselling it. We see in India and in, in, in Africa mobile phones in communities where there is no electricity. There's an entrepreneur who has a business that every week they take all the mobile phones and they bicycle 50 miles away and recharge them all and bicycle back. Right? So there's, there's a lot of new entrepreneurship out there. There's enormous entrepreneurship in Africa and India. These people haven't had the ability to become entrepreneurs because they have, there's no markets. There's no way of earning money. There's no way of showing what you can do. And so these kinds of search tools, and then this targeted information. So for example, on, the day, on what we just sh saw in Kerala or state, it's still sometimes, you, in, if, if you read the paper, and I have it with me, sometimes they, they call hundreds of people or SMS hundreds of people to get the best price. Well, that's really inefficient. Right? That's pre-Google. Right? There must be a better way of doing that. There must be some aggregation function one can do. And there must be a best price algorithm you can develop so they don't have to go through this. Right? Uh, and this is, you know, this fishermen, farmers, there's all kinds of, you know, the, the kinds of agriculture basic industries that we think about, that we don't think about here anymore. I mean, how many people here want to be a fisherman, right? But these are real sources of wealth in these economies, and we can make it even better if we're able to provide them with better search, better ways of getting information. Now it's extremely rudimentary. It's person to person. Depends on who you know. There's some other person you don't know who give you a better price. You yeah, know, that's... So there's, I think, enormous opportunities out here. But I think we also need more research on the ways in which they're doing, how they're using SMS, how they're using voice, and how we can provide search tools to the illiterate. Uh, job opportunities, social, even social networks, which are very dense in these countries. Uh, you know, I don't know of any uh, you know, MySpace that exists in India and Africa for these people. Uh, education. Yeah. Uh, and my, my, my final slide is, uh, I, I already asked the question. I got the answer. What's the main developing world issue for PC and mobile search? Illiteracy. So what can Google do? I call it the Google Literacy Program. Why don't you help them become literate? And literate in novel ways, you know, because on the mobile phone, we do have a way of becoming literate. I mean, we could think of the mobile phone and an educational program in a mobile phone with a screen. We could think, I'm sure you can find a way of giving these people simple literacy on the mobile phone. Right? Mobile phone is the, is the instrument at the moment could be PCs in 10 or 15 years. Doesn't mean, I'm not saying here that we're going to end at mobile phones and that the landlines won't come back 
and bandwidth won't appear. But this is the, the screen at the moment. And the screen at the moment has, has its problems. The problems are that people can't use them sufficiently. I want to, you know, as, a, as an economist, I want Africa to grow. I want them to have more opportunities for education and for jobs and, and to get better prices for their goods and to understand what market opportunities are. And for that, they need information. Uh, and I think you can help provide that information. And it's good for Africa and it's good for Google, uh, right? Because as they become literate, then they go to Google search. Right? And, uh, and again, there might be advertising. I, I, I mean, I haven't re I'm sure you, you have thought about all these. But uh, so l let me leave you with, with this uh, uh, program, this advocacy that uh, if Google really wants to help Africa, I think one way you can help is by helping these people become literate and using your enormous technical abilities and your enormous humanitarianism to develop the tools for mobile phones, which have all the letters, they have the numbers, they have a screen, they're interactive, they're personal. Think of the ways in which you can help Africa uh, by being as great as Google is for them. Thanks. So lot, lots of time for questions, I hope. Um, about literacy, uh, I think it's certainly much better in India, but have you heard about the Google.org's support for the same language subtitling of movies? It works better in India because they have works. a huge movie industry. And you know what? A movie screen is much bigger. A movie screen is much bigger. <laughs> and they are going to movies yeah. anyway, yeah. so getting the, the writing underneath is teaching and practicing literacy. I don't know if that would work in Africa. It may depend. Yeah, because there's so many different languages, and so, some, some I, I don't know what the some how big have a very uh, healthy yeah. movie-making culture. If you're, yeah. for example, other side may not. I didn't know about the program, but yeah, absolutely, that's a big help as a start. So if you've got a cell phone moving out there, um, is it possible that they would provide a draw for like, you know, hey, this literacy stuff is actually important? Would it make it, would it motivate enough getting, you know, say, kids to be educated? I think that's a very good point. Uh, the question is, uh, the fact that mobile phones are spreading like wildfire. I mean, we're seeing penetration rates, you know, 60, 70 percent in, in these developing countries. Uh, because they have it and they want to use it, I think there is a desire to be literate. I think that. Uh, the mobile phone gives them a reason to be literate where there wasn't one before. So it's both a tool and it's a draw. It's, uh, so I think you're absolutely right that uh, the fact that these people, these kids now have mobile phones, or let's not just think about the kids, let's think about the older generation as well. Because they have these mobile phones, it now gives them the potential to become literate. They're not going to go back to school. Traveling to school can also be arduous and costly. And this is, you know, you can personalize the program. You can learn what you need. So, I, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it, it's, uh, on, it adds to the demand for literacy enormously. They, they want to SMS each other. That's, I don't know. But yeah, you think that's the, that would be the, ne the, the next step, yeah. I had a question about the fish prices. Yes. You said that people paid less for the fish, fishermen earned more for their fish. The fishermen providing a lot more fish was the new man making a lot less money. How did, how did that work out? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's the reduction of the inefficiency. They're getting a lot more revenue because there's no wasted catch. 
and they're going to the port that gives them the best price. So that's how revenue can go up and still prices fall for everybody because we eliminate the inefficiencies uh, when there are no markets functioning. So it's really re removing the inefficiencies is kind of win-win that both the, bu the buyers and the sellers are better off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome.